Right, it, it is indeed quite bright here, actually, so not, un, not un, unlike in Glasgow when it's always grey. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, um, for the invitation to come and talk to you in this excellent meeting on the uh, new standards of care and how they implement them. And as already alluded, uh, there are changes in the bone health monitoring and also endocrine management, which I'll hope to talk through, and we can open up the discussion. Already we know there were some talks about uh, side effects, endocrine and bone consequences in the steroid <laughs> session. So firstly, uh, just to um, mention that in Glasgow, we're very focused on looking at bone health and endocrine consequences in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And with uh, funding from the Scottish Government, uh, Action Duchenne and Muscular Dystrophy UK, we've been embarking on a prospective study, uh, including uh, use of high-resolution MRI, looking at bone and muscle in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. I can share some preliminary results in discussion, and hopefully some of these results will be submitted for publication in the next 12 months. <coughs> So I'm an endocrinologist and I'm often an alien in such a muscle world and clearly I need to acknowledge the collaboration and the cooperation of my neuromuscular team. Uh, Dr. Ian Horrocks, who's the main neuromuscular consultant in Glasgow. Dr. Shuko Joseph, who's my PhD <laughs> student and a neuromuscular trainee who's embarking on a lot of the bone work and also the rest of the neuromuscular team. So let's move on and let's start with bone. So we've heard about osteoporosis in Duchenne's, we've heard about the potential role of steroids, and there's no doubt that steroids plays a major role. But we, may not, we must not forget there are multiple risk factors on the skeleton, not least of it, which is actually the underlying condition itself for muscle wasting, and also possibly a degree of low-grade inflammation. I won't talk about the etiology in this specific talk, but no doubt there are persistent and irreversible, irreversible insult to the skeleton in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it's not just due to steroids. However, as already alluded, there are potential differences on the skeleton and endocrine consequences, depending on the, um, the steroid regimen, and indeed there's some already emerging published data. So fractures are common. And depending on the publication you read, and some of it depends on standards of care, steroid regimen, uh, steroid class itself potentially, uh, fractures can be observed in at least 50% up to about 75%. But there are also consequences of fractures that we need to bear in mind for the boy with Duchenne's. So firstly, we all should be fairly familiar with the fact that a, the first long bone fracture, and we are wanting to prolong ambulation in boys with Duchenne, can be associated with early and premature loss of ambulation in up to about 40% following the first long bone fracture. I also want to just raise the rare but potentially serious complication of fat embolism, which has been reported in some boys with Duchenne's following fractures and some following just falls as well, and that needs to be borne in mind if we come back to about emergency management. Vertebral fractures can cause severe, acute, catastrophic pain, but can also be associated a bit with chronic ongoing back pain, which may impair quality of life and how a young person, an adolescent or young adult, functions. But one other thing that we need to consider, because there's a lot more focus on vertebral fractures in these new standards of care, particularly identifying early, is the fact that if we don't do that in postmenopausal women with vertebral fractures, not yet been described in boys with Duchenne's, but maybe we need to consider this in an a, a new cohort that's now transitioning, is that with progressive vertebral fractures in elderly women, you can develop progressive kyphosis, and this can be associated with restrictive lung disease, at least in a small number of postmenopausal women. One thing to actually mention as well is, although I'm not going to be talking about the management of fractures itself, but it's clearly a multidisciplinary team effort. In our cohort in Scotland, lo long bone fracture, the etiology of it, up to about 40% is actually falls from wheelchair, and we need our therapists to actually be assessing these kind of issue wheelchair fit properly as well, because it's not just about drugs, it's not just about steroids, but I think therapy, physical therapy, is also very crucial. So let's talk about the standards of care on bone, which has already been shown. And, um, and most, if not all of you, would have read this. And I'm just going to focus on the change in the current standards of care. And as Valeria has already mentioned, there is a move from a BMD-centric uh, monitoring and also treatment base of osteoporosis in Duchenne's to one that's much more focused on vertebral fractures because 
there's already understanding from the last 10 years that in young people, particularly growing children and adolescents, that BMD particularly is not that helpful, but identifying vertebral fractures is. And what the new care consensus suggests that now all boys with Duchenne should have a lateral thoracolumbar spine x-ray at least every two years, it says one to two years in steroid treated, and at least three years if not on steroids. So that needs to be how we need to implement that in clinical practice. DEXA is still recommended, but in some countries, if there's difficulties in accessing DEXA, for instance, due to financial reasons or access to pediatric DEXA scanner, really you should prioritize a spine x-ray over a DEXA scan because identifying vertebral fracture, not a BMD threshold, is what actually helps you institute treatment based on the new standards of care. So that's something to bear in mind. DEXA, however, is very important if you're actually considering or you're indeed starting bone protective therapy because you want to know that you're not overdoing things. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Vitamin D levels annually, and I don't think that's actually changed from the past care consensus. So really, it's what we need to, uh, to bring it out there and implement is actually uh, ensuring that we, we are performing lateral thoracic lumbar spine x-rays. There are some issues with DEXA scanning um, for some of those. Some of you may be familiar with this, but if you're not, just bear with me. So DEXA scan in children is not as useful compared to DEXA scanning in adults, particularly postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, uh, based as a treatment algorithm. In adults, a DEXA T-score, which is your DEXA BMD compared to a 25-year-old of the same gender, at least in adults with postmenopausal osteoporosis, have been shown to be predictive of fractures, so there are specific threshold. So firstly, this does not exist in children with chronic disease, and indeed, mentioned in the care consensus, you can have fragility fractures, including vertebral fractures, with a BMD a Z score, which is within the normal range, i.e. higher than the minus two as standard deviation. There are also issues about performing DEXA scans in children because it is a two-dimensional technique, purely comparing a DEXA BMD to age and gender is not appropriate in children with chronic disease, particularly when there is short stature. You need to adjust your DEXA BMD for size, and generally it is by height. You can do that by lean mass, by DEXA bone area, puberty, or bone age. But there are some issues with that, and I'll come to that in a bit. So over the last 10 years or so, there's already been a shift in how we manage uh, pediatric osteoporosis, and that's reflected in the DMD care consensus. And that is that the diagnosis of osteoporosis in young people is not DEXA densitometry dependent. And therefore, the decision to commence bone protective therapy, and I'm specifically talking about more bisphosphonate therapy, although there are other options available coming soon, should not be densitometry dependent. So if you've got a child who's got a DEXA BMD Z score, even though you size a which is say, let's say, minus three SD, that shouldn't prompt you to start bisphosphonate. Okay? And there are a few reasons. So firstly, depending on the normative data that you use to, act, to adjust your DEX at, uh, Z score, and or, or also the method of size correction, these results at an individual level can vary, and it can be up to about one standard deviation. They are closely associated, but there's variation depending on the method of size correction and the normative data. As has already mentioned, and work that I've done my, uh, myself about 10 years ago, in children, children in chronic condition, you don't see that DEXA threshold that you actually see slightly clearer in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis. And therefore, it's a move away from DEXA, although, as mentioned, DEXA is still important, particularly if you're commencing bone protective therapy. And this is already reflected in a international consensus in 2013, which is actually due to be updated by the International Society of Clinical Densitometry. And what it actually says is that the finding of one or more vertebral compression fractures in, is indicative of osteoporosis in young people, regardless of your DEXA BMD. 
the consensus gives some indications of how many uh, long bone fractures are indicative of um, osteoporosis, but I think they're just guidance. One of the other things in clinical practice that we need to also ask is about the mechanism of fractures, because there are definitions of fragility of fractures, and that is fractures from standing or sitting position. And a lot of these boys with Duchenne, you'll know they can stand, they fall, they fall on mud, and they fracture the femur. That's a fragility fracture. So, uh, and why, why, why is there such much focus on vertebral fractures? A lot of the work, not yet, not yet as uh, Valeria said, mentioned, the care consent, standards of care is still expert consensus, but it, we have already evidence based from other children with chronic conditions. And these are elegant studies performed by investigators from Ot uh, Canada based in Ottawa of prospective studies nationwide in Canada in childhood leukemia, childhood rheumatic diseases, and childhood kidney diseases all require some degree of steroid therapy. And what they have done is essentially what the new standards of care suggest should be done in boys with Duchenne's where they systematically screen these children annually with a lateral thoracolumbar spine x-ray. And in children with leukemia at diagnosis, 16% have crushed vertebral fractures prior to starting steroids, and over follow-up, at least about 25% develop further vertebral fractures. And about 40% of these who actually have vertebral fractures in imaging are asymptomatic. We're doing similar studies in cohorts with Duchenne's, and I'm saying, I'm, I can tell you that, in fact, we're seeing similar, if not higher, incidence of vertebral fractures. Now, what is the rationale, therefore, of vertebral fracture screening in the new standards of care for Duchenne? And that is because spontaneous and complete reshaping of the vertebra, i.e. improvement of osteoporosis in children with chronic condition, can happen in other groups of chronic condition without any bone, bone protective therapy. And the classic example is groups of children with leukemia, because they present young, they are treated, they have specific blocks of steroids for about a year or two years. They're cured of the disease. They have no longer steroids. And what drives improvement of osteoporosis and reshaping of the vertebra at that time is, in fact, linear growth, which, as we know, particularly boys with Duchenne's who are on daily steroids, for instance, you can often see absent growth, not just poor growth. So the insult to the skeleton in Duchenne's at the moment is irreversible and, in fact, actually permanent. And catch-up growth is minimal or absent. But based on one small series in uh, Canada, we know that there's perhaps some stabilization of vertebral fracture and the possibility of some incomplete reshaping in boys with Duchenne's with vertebral fracture if you treat this boys with IV bisphosphonate. But I must say, it's still only a small series, and the, the community still needs to look into it to, to truly ascertain the effects. Now, there are some issues about implementation of the standards of care, because the standards of care um, wants us to, uh, the, the standards of care recommends starting bisphosphonate, not just based on pain, but based on degree of vertebral fractures. And there are accepted definitions of how you grade vertebral fractures called the Ganan method. Um, and Ganan 1 is when you've got mild vertebral fractures, Ganan 2 if it's moderate, and Ganan 3 which is severe. I'll come to you about the standards of care later and when we actually start recommends bisphosphonate. So standards of care recommends a secondary prevention method, so not primary prevention. There is still an absence of any good um, um, a trial or published studies on the use of prophylactic bisphosphonate for prevention of osteoporosis in Duchenne's, although I'm aware it's done in some centers. It also recommends the use of IV bisphosphonate once you detect skeletal fragility, not oral bisphosphonate. It is based on expert experience, and it's based on extrapolation from another childhood condition that we see in pediatric bone of osteogenesis imperfecta, in that oral bisphosphonate does not seem to lead to improvement in vertebral height and dose of vertebral fractures in that group of condition, whereas IV does. Okay, so it is extra extrapolation. What the new standards of care suggest is that we now treat painful vertebral fracture, which we always have done. Uh, but it's one thing to just be a bit more aware if, if boys do complain of pain and to think of vertebral fractures. But remember, coming back to the Ganant staging, which I just showed in the last slide, the new standards of care suggest that if there is moderate, i.e. Ganant 2, even without pain, 
there needs to be at least consideration of bisphosphonate therapy. And clearly, in the clinical practice, not quite specifically addressed in the standards of care, but if there's a lot of fragility fractures or fractures, uh, severe fractures, long limb, which is very minimal injury, that could also prompt the consideration of bisphosphonate. Whereas previously, um, we would generally treat these boys with bisphosphonate for a period of a couple of years. There is now thought, and again, it's expert opinion, that because the insult to the skeleton is permanent and irreversible, that after two years of therapy, we need to consider longer periods, at least out, up to adult maturity, but perhaps less frequent, perhaps at a lower dose. There are still lots of uncertainties of what we do with adults who then transition onto the adult service about management of bone protective therapy, but that's um, beyond uh, the scope of this talk. And clearly, we need careful monitoring if these boys are on bisphosphonate therapy. Uh, I've always been asked, like, what are the consequences of staying on bisphosphonate long term? Well, in adults, not quite in children, osteonecrosis of the jaw have been reported in, in people treated with bisphosphonate therapy. Now, these are probably unique in such that these are usually in adults who've got poor nutrition, long-standing chronic disease like lymphoma, hematology uh, malignancies, and also renal failure. But poor dental hy hygiene, poor nutrition, and long-term steroids are also some of the risk factors. And as we can see in our boys with Duchenne, some of this may actually come into play. So it's not to be completely uh, wary of bisphosphonate. It just means that it needs monitoring. And I think Elizabeth will be, will be, will be with me to say that dental hygiene is often ignored in these boys anyway. So whilst I have said that DEXA may not be as useful, but there are new modalities in newer generation DEXAs which may actually assist in screening of these boys. And I think some centers in the Netherlands may have some of these newer DEXAs, particularly the iDEXA. Uh, there's a paper that our group published a couple of years ago, but uh, uh, in all kinds of ch children, not just Duchenne's, and replicated by investigators in Birmingham and Sheffield. And what the new DEXA can do is in fact actually get images that are good enough with equivalent um, clarity to allow identification of vertebral fracture. And these are actually pictures from two children on the left on the two boxes, so the lateral thoracolumbar spine x-ray, and the one where the spine is all on one image, that's the DEXA. And in fact, personally, quite often, the DEXA image is also much more useful because you've got all the vertebral level on one, on one image because one of the issues I sometimes have, particularly comparing changes on the lateral spine x-ray on two images, is which level it is. Okay. So that can be something that may assist because radiation is also lower. So what are some of the challenges of implementing the bone standards of care? It is getting the right x-ray. We need lateral. We also need lateral thoracolumbar images because, in fact, data from the STOP studies in Canada show that in glucocorticoid osteoporosis, a large proportion of vertebral fractures are, in fact, in the, thora in the thoracic region. So if you actually do just a lumbar, x lumbar lateral x-ray, you may miss these fractures. Getting the right report is an issue, and that's something I think you need to engage with your local pediatric radiologists particularly. Remembering that overall, vertebral fractures are still not common in the pediatric population as opposed to the adult population. And it's probably only made relatively recently that we're doing a lot more of these x-rays. So some of the pediatric radiologists may still be less experienced with reporting a vertebral fracture, particularly with Ganan staging. I don't have the right answer, but I think it's something that you need to have local dialogue. I personally look at all these x-rays myself as well on top of the radiology reporting. So coming back to implementation of standards of care, and this is something that just came out, I think, last week from the MD Starnet. It's obviously based on the previous care consensus, which is more DEXA focus. And what's quite interesting from this paper is that, in fact, actually, if you look at, uh, they, they looked at a cohort from MD Starnet and looked at how many of them actually had bone and endocrine, bone monitoring as per the old standards of care, and they talked a little bit about endocrine involvement as well. And you can see that in all these years of a relatively large cohort of those boys who would have qualified for a DEXA scan based on the past standards of care, a very small number only had a DEXA scanning. So that we need to implement it, not just have the standards of care. In Scotland, in our experience, um, over a cohort, over at least a two-year period, 63% of children who, had, who were on steroids had at least one DEXA scan. So not great, and it's something that we really need to get it out there. We need to implement it. 
Elizabeth wanted me to talk about adult bone monitoring, and that's actually just a whole talk by itself, and there's still a whole lot of controversies. Um, adult, particularly, po which is largely post-monopausal osteoporosis uh, monitoring, is uh, still DEXA-BMD-centric, okay? So there's still not as much focus on lateral images. There are difficulties in obtaining some of these images in adult hospital. Unfortunately, I'm not sure about your setting, uh, even simple things like hoisting in the adult radiology hospital, or some of them, is just purely not available, and it's just extremely challenging. Uh, some of the adult um, patients who already have metal in because of scoliosis, your lumbar spine dexa BMD is completely meaning meaningless because you're measuring metal. Lateral thoracolumbar images is also quite difficult because it could obscure quite a lot of the vertebra, so those are challenges. And in the adult population, BMD is still not size corrected, so in the transition period, if you've got a DEXA BMD in the pediatric population, a hospital which size corrects, and you then actually have a DEXA in the adult hospital which doesn't size correct because your, boys with Duchenne, your boy with Duchenne, who's 18 or 19, maybe minus three standard deviation, the, 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 the score will look as if it's deteriorated significantly. That just needs to be borne in mind. Newer methods of uh, assessing bone, the peripheral quantitative computer tomography, which is still largely a research tool, although in some pediatric hospitals, that's available. That gives a bit more information on bone size, differentiates between cortical and trabecular bone density, but it can also be done in the radius, which may be something that may be useful in adult uh, bone monitoring. This is not part of the care consensus, but Elizabeth wanted me to have my thoughts. So let's come back to bisphosphonate therapy and why it may not be the most appropriate drug and why perhaps other investigative agents need to be considered in mind, perhaps in clinical trials. Um, invest Osteoporosis in boys with Duchenne's is a low bone turnover state. Bisphosphonate therapy targets bone resorption, i.e. lowers bone breakdown. In our studies, and in uh, this elegant study again from the Canadian group where they actually took bone biopsies from children with Duchenne's prior to starting bisphosphonate because of vertebral fractures and after a period of a couple of years, they found that bone turnover was already low at the bone prior to starting bisphosphonate and it fell further. What does this mean for the boy with Duchenne's? Nobody really knows yet, but I suppose uh, further suppression of bone turnover may lead to further fractures in the long term, but nobody really knows. So uh, we convened in June in an ANMC workshop where a few of us were here, Eric, um, Imelda, Pat, and uh, Elizabeth, where we discussed the issue of osteoporosis and particularly how there may be a possibility of looking into, into clinical trials. There are major hurdles which we have discussed and hopefully will be out in the report, but that's something to consider. There are also newer agents, newer anti-resorptive agents, which may have less side effects. There are some side effects of IV bisphosphonate, acute phase reaction. There are also better drugs, potentially, at least theoretically, which increases bone formation, which we may need to investigate in the future. But there are challenges of conducting trials in this, in, in, in this day and age. Let's talk about puberty, and I actually am, uh, uh, I, and, and this is another plug for the information, uh, information, parent information book and the videos, and I'm glad there's actually a video specifically on puberty. There's a lot of misconception about puberty, uh, thinking that puberty is bad for boys, but uh, boys with Duchenne's, we need to remember that these boys are now living independently, they're going to universities, they're having relationships. We need to address puberty and not assume that this is something that's not important for them. Uh, this needs to be monitored and at least discussed with them. In Scotland, in our experience, and I will be interested to hear what uh, local experiences are, um, of the almost 30% of boys with Duchenne's who is 14 years of older, this was a couple of years ago, only about f just under 50% had puberty examined, and now we already know that the new standards of care say that this needs to be done. Of those who were actually examined, close to about 80% of them had testes less than formal, i.e. no puberty. Okay? As, as at that point of study, 7-1 testosterone, but since all who actually had no puberty had started on testosterone. And about 20% actually had signs of puberty, and I must say, and probably in line with some people who have really talked about in, uh, early in the steroid session, is that those who had signs of puberty were either those who discontinued steroids or on very low dose pulse therapy. And I must say, that seems to mirror our prospective study where I have clinically examined all these boys as well. 
So what does the standards of care say? The standards of care say that all boys need to have puberty examined, i.e. test this examination from the age of nine uh, from uh, every six monthly. And I think it is good that it's put out there so we think about it. But implementing it, I think, in reality is going to be extremely challenging. And what I must say is that you need local dialogue in your own setting and with your endocrinologist. And I would also say that I think it's best for these boys, particularly once they become non-ambulant, non to actually have somebody who actually knows what they're doing and do it appropriately rather than do it repeatedly and actually inaccurately. Certainly in my own institution, uh, we've had, uh, uh, we've had a, a pathway where by the age of 12 to 13, at least they're referred to see me so they're actually examined properly. So I think that's something that we need, you need to look into what's best for your boys and in your setting. And the standards of care now says that it, testosterone therapy should be considered from the age of 14, and that's to be built over a period of two to three years, uh, but that can be considered from or discussed from the age of 12. These boys don't, at least the ones on daily therapy, in my opinion, don't just have delayed puberty, they have absent puberty and they actually have hypogonadism. They have got central hypogonadism because uh, there's data from the Newcastle group and also from my, a lot of our clinical exam uh, experience is that you treat them with several years of testosterone therapy. If you've got other chronic disease, if the insult is reversible, your testes size grows. But boys with Duchenne con continue to have small testes even though they virilize, i.e. they get pubic hair and they get genital enlargement with testosterone therapy. So um, there is little out there in terms of testosterone, but Volker and Newcastle investigators have an uh, open-label testosterone trial in, I think, about 20 uh, adolescents, and they're hoping to ex uh, get some extension grants to actually look at testosterone levels and hypogonadism in adults with Duchenne's, and I think that would be very important. There may be a need to see that, can, do we need to start testosterone a bit earlier if they're hypogonadal, if, and hypogonadism and testosterone and puberty is important for bones. If we wait till 14, is it just good thing, but just far too late? That needs investigation. And like I say, adults with Duchenne on daily therapy, at least, may have low or borderline testosterone therapy, and whilst not actually addressed, might be something that our adult clinicians need to actually consider. Uh, there's excellent information leaflet. We've designed something a couple of years ago on puberty and hormones in Duchenne's, which you can access on the Scottish Muscle Network site. Gives a little bit more of an endocrine spiel to it if you're interested. Let's talk about growth. We've already heard that growth failure, short stature is common, but it is also an intriguing thing because it's probably not just due to steroids because we know about 25% of boys with Duchenne already have short stature, i.e. height standard deviation of less than minus two prior to steroids. So it may actually be an intrinsic issue or maybe due to the poor muscle tone, we don't know. We've got, with Volker and Newcastle, we've got a PhD student who's looking at laboratory studies of the growth plate and osteoporosis in mouse with Duchenne's. But steroids no doubt cause growth failure, no doubt it's class, it's, it's regimen dependent, and there may also be uh, some evidence that suggests that, in fact, it may be class-dependent as well, as there's at least two publications which shows, suggest that the flasicode may be associated with greater growth failure. Height measurement is challenging, and the new care consensus suggests that we should be doing ulnar length at even starting from the point when they're non-ambulant, and that's really important, so to allow tracking. Height is not just important because endocrinologists want to discuss growth hormone. You need height for adjustment of body mass index. You need height for adjustment of blood pressure and lung function. And so that's very important. There are some issues about ulnar length which just needs to be borne in mind. The ulnar length height prediction is based on validation studies in healthy children. Okay? And I think there are several, but this is one of the ones that's common, commonly used. And if you can see from the prediction equation, Age is one of them, and I would say that you would find that, particularly boys who are on daily steroids, once they get to a certain age, there is practically no growth. But you've got age in there as an equation. And what Zoe Davidson, one of the research nutritionists from Melbourne, shows clearly in this growth chart is to highlight a point that, in fact, you've got severe short stature and growth failure, in fact, at the point when you were able to get height, the child loses ambulation, you do ulnar length, and those are heights based on ulnar length prediction. It seems as if the, the, the child is now above average. Needs to be borne in mind. I don't know what the right answer is. 
Growth hormone therapy is not routinely recommended, but unless if there's growth hormone deficiency that be considered. In some countries, um, if it's out of license indication, you can't prescribe it anyway. But there's actually very, very little data. Um, a retrospective study from um, clinical evaluation of um, um, Brenda Wong and Melan Rattus group in uh, Cincinnati showed that perhaps introducing growth hormone could improve growth rate. But one thing is that, firstly, this is the only study, but we need to ask what is the child's expectation because this study shows and other studies in chronic condition is that you improve growth rate but they remain very short. After one year of treatment, these children are still about minus three standard deviation. It may not be what the boy is expecting. There are side effects, um, and it's hard to tell whether they're due to growth hormones. Some of it are growth hormone related side effects, but certainly growth hormone, particularly higher dose growth hormone in non growth hormone deficient states, is associated with impaired glucose tolerance. In a group where you, are, have, where you already have risk factors of obesity and steroid treatment, that needs to be borne in mind. She found a couple with impaired glucose tolerance, but studies in children with juvenile arthritis, which are treated also with steroids, but perhaps not as long as Duchenne's, showed that if you use growth hormone in those indications, in those children, close to about 40% have impaired glucose tolerance and 5% had type 2 diabetes, which is transient and reversible upon stopping. So something to consider. Uh, I think it can be discussed with the family if they want to uh, know about it with an endocrinologist, but shouldn't be routinely used. Uh, these are some of the challenges of implementation already, and I've uh, talked about that, and I'm not going to um, uh, reiterate that. The last bit of it is about adrenal suppression, and I think all children on long-term steroids uh, are at risk of adrenal suppression. The key of whether pulse therapy is associated with adrenal suppression is an interesting question. Interesting to hear more from, the, uh, uh, from Eric because I can't find any literature. Um, and what the new care consensus suggests is that there needs to be an emergency plan in place and access to hydrocortisone as, as injections during severe illnesses, particularly with vomiting illnesses. Um, and also there needs to be plans in place during surgery, for instance, and periods when nil by mouth. Care needs to be borne with IV bisphosphonate because that has been associated with acute uh, flu-like reactions and vomiting, and you need to think about that. Uh, and clearly also there are specific uh, uh, details in the standards of care about discontinuing steroids, like the PJ Nikoff steroid protocol. But also be, do, be, do be aware that some of these things, there may be local endocrine pathways already, and it may be that you need to actually dialogue with your local endocrinologist. So, um, Adrenal suppression, important to actually address it, important to counsel of families, important for an emergency plan in place. The specific details of it may need dialogue with your local, um, with your local endocrinologist. So I've gone through bone, I've gone through puberty, I've gone through growth failure, I've gone through adrenal insufficiency, but there are also other complications which are not addressed by the standards of care. Elizabeth organized an excellent nutrition workshop which highlights gaps, for instance, in metabolic syndrome, in type 2 diabetes, which I think as a community we need to consider and think about. So thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take some questions.